tech and good body language and he was speaking something that everybody could relate to everybody already had prior knowledge about the facts so they could connect with him so i think that made him made the speech more persuasive then why don't we do something like that uh, uh, artists do in a concert because that is the most effective one okay the singer has eye, cancer, eye, eye contact and everybody is jumping then why don't we do the same thing instead of talking to the judge why don't we sing a very good song before the judge every time when you go to mooting or you go to argue the case why don't you write a uh, music or uh, compose a song out of every case and then with the music guitar and all and you sing a song to the judge because judge will understand many more uh, ideas than you speak to him why don't you go with the music okay ranjit ranjit's metallic uh, guitar okay and then somebody other beating the drums so lawyers instead of reading book okay lawyer instead of reading case file making arguments is not it better to write a song out of the case and then go with the music in front of the judge and then do like this okay and then sing a very good song judge will be very happy and understands your language so the case will be in your favor why don't we do is not that a bit a better idea so do it because it's a music song to sing before the jazz with a beautiful music that's how we can make more chord better than you speak or make argument so what we do <clears throat> what we do today is a reflection of what happened in the past so because uh, such musical performances did not happen in the court in the past our the generation of the past did not perform such activities yes so therefore doing... post year don't make this kind of argument i have said you have to rebel yes you are not this third year and second year you have learned more and what did i say you need to rebel and you have to create new idea so if something was not happening that in the court in the past now you can start it so new ideas if you do not promote new ideas the world will not be moving ahead so it's not it necessary that you do it so change argument by beautiful music rhythmic music then i say like uh, show good thing in a musical rhythmic way to the jazz he understands or she understands so why cannot we start music in the court instead of argument i'm sorry so there must have been a, a merit a merit for the the people of the past to use argument in court rather than on other methods so we must rather than going for abrupt change we must first understand why people used to argue in the court in the past what is the merit of it what are its disadvantages and what could be done to make it better rather than going for an abrupt change such as switching to music to argue in court okay binda why not What he was talking about? What he was talking about? Yes. Uh, he was talking about that. What uh, first day he was asking a question that how many of the people who uh, first time I don't remember second day is how many of the people know that my wife is dead and second day he was talking about the form of the government. Uh, he asked that what sort of the form of the government you you are in favor of? So, uh, in your opinion, why that speech was so effective? So. Vijay told for me uh, uh, eye contact and body gesture and also uh, very importantly he was being able to uh, grab the attention of everyone and everyone was listening to him. Shampura was the key uh, to and uh, the voice and the tone at which he spoke and uh, <laughs> Okay, Pranjali come in. 
So the way that, what is that way? Go on. <coughs> it's stress. Stress, yes. Stress in certain words because the way we stress in certain words influences the way we think and it directly uh, affects our psychology, the way we think. And it is uh, evident in the way that I listen to as well when a, a speaker in front of me is speaking something and the way he stresses some words, it directly relates to me. I listen to it and it's uh, it forms more of a concrete idea or a concrete place in my mind. And Arya, what do you think? I think uh, that's very effective because, first of all, he was very confident. He looked like he was uh, very sure of what he was, say, uh, what he was saying. He wanted to uh, uh, advise them, but not in a way that he already lived, but he, he was giving them advice to use it. So I think uh, also the stress and the process and the way he speaks. And Anusha, why this was effective? So personally, I'd like his speech because he was interacting with the audience. It's very important that you interact with the audience in order to make sure that they are understanding what you're trying to say and he was engaging the audience, therefore this was a good speech. And Rishabh, why this is important for you? I think it was important because of the music. I think the music... I think it was important because of the music. I think the music enhances the feeling in which you perceive anything and if we included music in our mood codes, maybe that would be a good idea but uh, uh, because, and I also think the reason why there is no music in mood codes is because uh, we are user lawyers and not musicians so everybody may not have an equal hand in how to include the music in their mood codes. Okay, Masumallah. As he was, uh, it was something uh, personal to him, so he was able to connect with the audience and the audience could relate to him. Anybody else who have some idea, okay? Nirma? Go on, go on, go on. Don't wait for my. Uh, the speech was effective because he spoke like he meant it and uh, he emphasized how important the thing is what he's speaking about. So that is uh, so why I think he. Okay, Roji? I would uh, just give one word that uh, for this speech, why this was effective, and the word is thought-provoking. I, th I think this speech was really thought-provoking for the audience because the, the person who was speaking could actually relate that how the scenario was go was affecting their lives, how they not speaking up for America was uh, like uh, affecting the country, which the people could really relate to, they could uh, process that thing in their mind and that's why he was able to get there. Well, uh, so this is very evident. Sit down. You also picked up some ideas, definitely, but uh, uh, most important thing is that art of advocacy. That means, what does it imply? Each a way of communication. Art of speech is a way of communication. Many people say effectively, but I do disagree and what I say is like, Art of Advocacy is a way of communication convincingly. It's not effectively. Many people can make very effective communication. And I said in the very beginning, the music, Okay, to sing a song is the most effective way of communication. But it's not necessary that the song will equally convincing the ideas in the mind of judge. Okay, so the art of advocacy in the field of uh, legal profession relates to something which we often define is convincing. The objective of art of advocacy is to create something so that you can convince your listener. 
your audience. And in art of advocacy, basically in the legal profession, your job is your audience. So you don't speak for someone who is in behind you. But that's where is the biggest problem. Most of the time, you try to speak to someone who is behind you, but not someone who is in your front. So the moment you start being influenced, that you have been speaking to a community behind you, believe that you failed already. So, convincing speech or convincing communication targets the person who is in your front or that is your audience. In legal profession, I said, he is or she is the judge which you are going to convince. If you do not convince, you fail. If you convince, you succeed. So the question is like, the entire objective of argument is to convince. So, for convincing, can you convince someone with a beautiful rhythm of speech and very fine words spoken in a very melodious way without content? Can you do that? Can you convince someone without content? Can you make arguments without content? If argument is a logic, you have already been taught a lot that a logic needs to have premise, first premise, or the major premise, the minor premise, and conclusion. And then we also add evidence for that, okay? Show that an argument consisting of logic does have content, means you need to know the convincing. You need to know the subject first. Only you have adequate knowledge about what you have been arguing about, you can create situation that judge can be convinced. So without knowledge, you can do nothing. Okay? Knowledge, therefore, is vital. You may have knowledge, but you may not know what is that content. It's so emphatic and important that you can convince the judge with. Therefore, you need to develop a skill to pick up by methodology applying, a very scientific methodology applying, that something in that subject is what is crucial. And that search which you do as a crucial, a very crucial, uh, very emphatic idea that you need to produce before the judge is what is called skill. Therefore, skill demands a very thorough research to find out that prioritized idea that you want to produce to. Only then comes art. Okay? First knowledge, second skill, and then art. You can do a lot without knowledge. You can do a lot without art having adequate knowledge and adequate skill. You still may be very convincing. But having very good art without knowledge and skill, you do nothing. So being artful does not mean that you are nowhere in knowledge and skill. Therefore, knowledge is predominant. Skill is predominant and art is very much necessary. Sure, most people think that a best lawyer is who speak nice. For me, a best lawyer is who 
who does studies are and uses a scale with a very scientific research to produce before the judge what is the crux of that case. So combination, combination of three things. Knowledge, skill, and art, these three things together comprise art of advocation. But it doesn't mean that the way you speak is less important. As I said that largely with a better knowledge and better skill, you can do a lot to convince the judge. But with art, what you can do is like, you will surely convince the judge. So what is the distinction? If you apply the art, there is no question that you fail to convince the judge. But if you only use knowledge and skill, there is a danger of you failing to convince the judge. So, these two things on the one hand, and the another thing on the other hand, they often, therefore, if you look at it from another way, weigh equal. Knowledge and skill weighs equal to art, or the art weighs equal to knowledge and skill. But then, if you start looking from the art perspective alone, then what you can say is that Art is not necessary to produce if you don't have a knowledge and skill. If you do not have words, if you do not have uh, what is called Kevin Satyo Geet Kokeri? Geet Life? Lyrics, okay. If you do not have lyrics, what song do you sing? It's not music. It's not a song. And that lyrics would be very important if it is melodious. Sarma taxi, kuddaicha, uta truck, kuddaicha, uta tractor, kuddaicha, that's a rap, yes? <laughs> to me, you like rap, but that's not very melodious, therefore, it doesn't attract me. Okay, sometime if I am not sleeping, I have nothing to do, I can enjoy it. But if I really have to think in the I want to be very happy. I want a very good music with very good lyrics and lyrics with very good melodious words. Then I feel convinced, I feel comfort, sure. Art of advocacy argument in the court is not very much different than this. So it's often I therefore say that. A lawyer is the most finest artist. You need not be trained to do play in the drama, or you need not learn to be a cinema hero or heroine. Every day you're doing exactly what you see in cinema. A lawyer, when he argues in the court, is doing exactly what the play he does. That piece of speech is not a real classroom teaching. It's definitely a, a piece of a cinema. But can you differentiate that that's a piece of cinema? Is that it exactly like what happens in a public speech? Okay? So, Exactly that cinema hero in that film who talks about law, the responsibility of the government, the objective of the constitution, and the accountability of the leader. He talks about to the mass is exactly what we do when we speak to the public platform. So, if you do that exactly in the court, you're doing movie, when we see the mo in the movie, the man is doing exactly that, then we believe that that's exactly what happens in the court. Sure, looking from that perspective, you need to learn to be a very good artist. As I said that, art alone sometimes works equal to knowledge and skill. It doesn't, I am suggesting you that, it doesn't mean that I'm suggesting you that 
you should go to court with art, doing very playful kind of presentation. I'm saying that have a knowledge first, and you can go to the court. When you have a knowledge and a skill that you have perfectly used, the art begins at the court, but the knowledge works at your law firm. When you are in moot court, knowledge you collect inside a dark room in a very difficult, dirty, okay, smelly, and tedious room that you have been doing the knowledge part in moot court. Sometimes you're sleeping, okay? Sometimes you're doing something funny, other kind of thing, okay? Sometimes two friends go out of the door because they cannot stay inside. Something happens over there. Sometimes they come in. But art you apply over there in the mood court venue where just have been listening to you. So the one part is very superficial, another is very lethargic. So if you compare it with the movie, cinema making, it's something like a novel on a scale. If you really see what cinema is suited in a place, the court, 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 and the dialogue repeated, somebody seeing from behind, you see that this is real drama is there. But that real drama, which converts in drama in the movie, it doesn't look like a drama, it looks like real. So the drama becomes real and the reality outside becomes drama. So when you are doing that in the room, mood, you are preparing mood court, it is something like that. It sounds that in the mood court room, you are preparing for writing memorials, you are uh, uh, rehearsing to do argument, it looks that you are doing drama. But that's a reality. But when you go to the Mutko room, you're actually doing drama, and then it, be, it looks like a reality. So this needs to be very clearly grasped by you if you want to understand the art of advocacy, and this is too important. With this three important thing, what I often say is that my field is different, okay? My field, though I said knowledge is vital, skill is vital, but I often believe as a trial advocacy teacher that a case is generally made not by much principles and not much by law, talk to the judge, but the art, the way that you talk to these things to, to the judge. Okay? So art counts a lot. Why art counts a lot? Now a couple of principles that we need to discuss. First principle is that you're not speaking to yourself, but you're speaking to audience. Since you're not speaking to yourself, but you're speaking to your audience, whether audience counts, whether audience understands or does not, it counts. What you understand does not. You understand everything of case. You have knowledge of every case cases. Aka issue to Nicaragua case and everything. That's you have all those stuffs in your mind. You understand what happens if we interpret that law and what consequence we can create it. You know everything. You're full of knowledge. You are full of ideas. And you are a genius. Suppose that you are a genius person in the world. Because you are the, you're the most important authority of that case. Everything is in your mind. But this, there is no wire like this so far created to connect from your head to judge's head so that everything will pass into your charge. The only thing so far, the only technology or the only way that we can pass our information to the judge is by our speech, by our words. There is no other thing, okay? You can even write down those words, those arguments, and you can give it to judge. But again, these words will not go inside the mind of judge. The judge has to understand this, what is written in that paper. Sure, 
your understanding needs to be transferred into the understanding of Jot. Principle. I repeat it again. That understanding that you have developed about the case needs to be transformed into the mind of the Jot. This is what's so important. So keep it in the mind. When you're preparing the mood court, what you need to always move with is that the understanding you have created in the mind needs to be transformed into the mind of judge. And this is not enough. What, what follow you need is that you need to transform the knowledge that you have in the mind to the mind of the judge in exact form or exact paradigm that you have formed it into your mind. Not differently. Not slightly differently. Or not with a different meaning. So if you if you speak a word, okay, if you speak a word when you are presenting, the meaning of the word you you understood when you spoke that word should go into the mind of judge with exact meaning that you understood in your mind, only then you will be able to convince the judge, otherwise you fail. Therefore, art of speech in this sense, as I said before that it is a way of convincing, and the way of convincing takes place by thus forming your ideas to the mind of judge, and when I say that, what I also add is that, transforming your ideas to the mind of judge means put your trust of the case in the trust of the judge's mind. Okay? So your trust should be the trust of the judge. Therefore, judge will understand what you say. Otherwise, you will not. Therefore, very interesting is like, the media that we transform your, your, our idea to the mind of judge is the speech. And therefore, a speech comes a lot in Mutkot. When a speech is used, so important media to transform ideas from the mind of yours to judge, then how can you make this speech so important are so effective and so convincing, therefore judges will understand your idea. So it involves a couple of very important things. One, semantics. Semantics is something, a science of language. Science, science of, rather you can say, composition of sentences and meaning of the sentences. Composition of sentence will differ the meaning of sentence. Let me give you an example. I ate rice. Okay? The sentence when I speak, I ate rice, and the sentence I speak, rice, comma, I ate. These are two different meanings. When I say rice, comma, I ate, I imply to me something different than the sentence I ate and I ate rice. So what you need to pronounce, what you need to say to the judge, you need to be conformed in your language. So this is called semantics. So you need to be very careful about semantics when you are making language to the judge. The word comes, the sentence counts, okay? And the meaning of the word also counts. Sometimes we use some different uh, vocabulary. So what therefore is a basic rule of art of advocacy is that it is always good for you to prepare your memorandum that means your memorial or your argument note 
to speak before the judge repeatedly so that when you are thinking something, preparing the case, the word that you are using should be instilled in your mind so that you should share the same word when you speak to the judge. So therefore, this art of advocacy is therefore very composite kind of thing. So I said, speech is very important. And speech involves semantics and also the structure of language or the form of language, you can say. Speech becomes effective if it is simple, if it is colloquial, and it doesn't involve very complex, complicated way of speech that we often do when reading essays to the general mass. Or the speech that we make it to the larger mass for the public consumptions to create then some kind of euphoria not for understanding. Okay? We are not creating euphoria in the mind of the judge so that after listening you speak, he will jump and say that Jindabad. No, judge is not going to do that. More you speak to the judge, seriously becomes because his mind will be his mind would be loaded by more and more ideas and you start creating a process of analysis as in mind. And if you do not give right language, colloquial language, you give very complex language, what obstructs is his analysis process. And if, it's, if his analysis process is obstructed, you expect something result, but he produces or she produces something different. And then you say that, I had such a nice argument before the job, but bloody Zaz didn't make it, okay? But that's your failure, it's not the job's failure. So be very simple. Very simple. Use very simple language, okay? Like in a very colloquial conversational way, so that judge will be able to grasp it. So that's the structure of the language, the form of the language, okay? I said semantics and structure of uh, language, other form of language. And third thing is combination of sentence and content, okay? If I say that there is a goal in the moon, it's my language. It is wrong if there is no goal in the moon. So that remains only a sentence. So what I often say is like, every sentence you use should be impregnated by idea, okay? So our language becomes logic if it has idea. If language does not have logic, then it becomes either a kind of analogy, metaphor, or something like a story, or something like poem, which does not have to give any idea to anyone. So I can say that, Gulab Timi Kati Ramri, Malai Mohit There is no idea. I just speak it for the sake of, some momentous, momentous kind of uh, comfort or happiness, that's all. But if I speak argument in the court, then you need to be sure that there is content in the sentence. So, semantics, structure of language, and idea or content in the argument. So keep these three things as mantras. I should always be considerate of the semantics, the meaning, and the grammar that I'm using. So, rice I ate is different than I ate rice. So you simply cannot produce words, jumble of words, or rumbles of words. You can play with words. Doesn't mean that your argument is effective. Second thing. Your language should be very structured, and when I say that language should be very structured, what I say is like, you should speak very conversational and very colloquial language, so that understanding of you and the judge remains at par, okay? You understand this one. And third thing, what I said is like, the language that you use, or the sentence that you use, 
should have a content. Without content, how good sentence should stay, but that doesn't become an argument. It is simply a useless language to speak. So, therefore, I always say, if you want to be a good speaker in the court, read language or law. Improve your language or law. Without improving your language, okay, you can do no good good court. So what a serious problem that I have encountered from the Nepalese student over the last many years in Mutkot <coughs> is the, the poor language they have. English is not their native language. So how far effective you would be in English, you cannot compete with the native speaker. Your own native language with lot of importance to build your loan language, you ignore your language, you add your language, therefore you don't have the basic grammar of your own language. When you don't have basic language of your own language, you have developed a habit of speaking Nepali language in a way that you do such a big injustice to you. If you speak a sentence, you speak Nepalese bar and do English now, okay? That's the kind of way that you speak. Learning the language is a kind of thick language. So your language is almost dead. Because your language in English, in Nepali, it's, your Nepalese language is so poor, you don't use literature, you don't use semantics, you don't create a structure of uh, your language and you don't use content in your own language, you have developed a habit of taking for granted. So exactly you produce rhetoric in Nepali, you also produce rhetorics in English. And rhetorics is war. Hatred in Mutkot. Do everything in Mutkot, but don't speak rhetoric. You speak every sentence or not. Okay? Every sentence you produce should be logic. Only then you can finish your argument in 20 minutes or 15 minutes. But if you talk a lot of rhetorics, you speak five minutes, you give one idea, but four minutes you are rumbling just up and down, and then you are trying to interpret it, or you are trying to give a justification, and then therefore you created more confusion in the mind of the job. You thought that you were making him clear. So there is a contradiction. You thought that I made him clear by speaking a lot, but your lot of speech, in fact, created confusion in the mind, and he lost the main idea that you told. So it is better to say main idea in a clock So sure. if you do not develop your Nepali language stronger, your English language would not also be very strong. Because what is your legal language in Nepal? So, how do you think in legal profession in Nepal? In what language? In Nepali. You create all your legal culture, thinking of law, in Nepali. And that's not only you, that's same in India. They all create their uh, legal culture of thinking, law in Hindi. So a Thai, a Thai man, lawyer, creates his legal culture of thinking in Thai language, okay? But then he or she has to produce in English. If your concept is to be built in your own language, the major, the major stuff of ideas that you have put into mind are not in English word, but they are in Nepali words. That means your mind works like a, a translating body. That means, if you have conceptualized that in Nepali perfectly, then your mind translates that into English in a perfect way. But, why Nepalese students have not this better performance in root court? Because they are conceptually not good in their own thinking language. So, native language or your mother tongue is your thinking language. The English is your speaking language. 
you always sleep and you dream, but you always dream in Nepal. Because your mind has been habitual to thinking, your mother language. So speaking language and thinking language, there are two different things. Until you develop or strengthen your thinking language, your speaking language would not be good. So the first part that I would like to end here is that start reading very good novels, very good essays written by Nepalese as a side study of you. Okay? When I read Uska Samsha Rara's story called Pratibanda, Paribanda, then I that when I do that, I really feel that, oh, I am a lawyer now. So it indoctrinates you to think in law. Okay? There are countless of books or novels written in uh, reflecting legal profession, uh, the attitude of lawyer, the attitude of judges. That's how you have to develop. Because they bring philosophy for you, they bring wider social context to you, and they bring a lot of other understanding on which law always works with. So if you think that without developing a very, very good thinking language in your mind, that is Nepali, it would be a stupid idea to think that I will think, I will speak a very good English. Yes, you will speak very good English, but that English would be thoughtless English. So this is art of advocacy. Language part, I give you an idea. So there are some other technical ideas. I say that the main thrust of art of advocacy is to put your mind into the uh, into judge mind. Okay? Put your ideas into the mind of judges. So at the time the result comes out, he will be repeating or retweeting what you thought. So when judgment he makes, then he or she does nothing but retreason of what you thought in the mind. So that coherence is very important. Now, how do we often approach art part of this uh, advocacy? I talked about your language and all scholars. Art is, I said, if you look it from the art perspective, that's my perspective, I already said that art works equal to knowledge and skill. But it doesn't mean that you should not concentrate yourself. Once you have completely prepared that part, then you come to the art part. So art is very important thing. So I always say, I always say to students, the best way to think is an analogy. Suppose you're going to watch a play in a big hall. How does the play begins? First the curtain is open. Then the lights are on. Gradually the light becomes more spectacular. And then someone comes and introduces. And that artist does its role. And then another artist comes. And here she does her role. Gradually that drama starts evolving, creating more plots, okay, creating more ideas, and uh, projecting masses to the mind of the people, and it evolves and evolves and evolves. At the end, there is the end, and there is a clear message to the audience. And either you are quite happy with this drama, or you are quite unhappy. Either you go within a very jolly, smiling mood, or you become quite depressed, quite upset, because the story affects your mind, okay? And it makes you to think a lot of things. Then, exactly is what is mood court, or what is trial in the court. You do always. What is here is like, you are, you are the director. As a lawyer, as a mutter, you are a director. You are not an artist. You are not a hero and heroine. Biggest mistake you make, both in court and mood court, is that you often assume that 
you are a hero and you are an heroine. Okay? So projecting yourself as hero and heroine. But exactly, you are neither hero nor heroine. Or not your cheap character or other character. You are a director. You have a compromis in more code, yes? In the compromis, there are a lot of characters. Or a state is there, a state's prime minister is there, a state's president is there, a state police force is there, or there are bars, or seas, or peace, a lot of things are there. That compromis is a story. Okay? There, inside the story, there are a lot of characters. If you think that you are a part of the play itself, you are an artist, then you behave like a, that prime minister inside the, inside the story, or you behave like a president inside the story. But if you behave like you are a director, you make these people work in the right way. So, as a director, the main artist in the drama, in the estates, comes and does exactly what you make to do here. Does he do, or does he do differently than you ask, or you prepare them to do? So that means, in the story, in the script, you pick up those things and then you, you, you create the plot in a way that you start with the beginning and in at the end. Many students' problem is that they do not know where to start and where to end. This is a serious challenge of the Nepalese motors. They start anywhere and they end anywhere but like in a drama the plot that starts a story and the plot that ends a story are consecutively successively evolve and goes to the end your presentation should exactly go like that way so you begin at the beginning and you end at the end and if you do that if you do that what are the skills some skills is that every drama has a perspective. Okay? Behind in drama you have a scene of village, okay? You make an artificial house, or you have chairs to sit down, and even if it is possible, some chicks have been chicks have been born in the state and they make a noise and they go around, okay? In 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 in, in if it is not possible for you to bring the real six, then you have dolls of chicks. There is a pot and everything. For that, if you have to make a presentation of the family, what do you do? You create a background. Only with that background, you make the people to think that this drama is a real drama. Without the background, if you do drama in the East Way, that's also a drama, okay? But that's only for the masses, not for the entertainment, not for the happiness. But when you go to drama stage, big hall, do you want to see a drama without background? Some people come and do dialogue and go back? Do you want that? So George wants the same. You have a drama, you have to have a background. So, every case therefore has a drama. Background. There is a background of the case. Something happened for the issue that you have been contesting. Behind it is their background. So first thing, to make your speech very convincing, what you look for is the shots of the background of the case and you give a very short background or you present like in the drama you give a perspective, you also give a perspective. Suppose that, suppose that Nepal was in a blockade and people were dying, people were not getting medicine in Nepal, people were not getting food. Suppose that Nepal thought to go to the International Court of Justice. And we brought the case in the International Court of Justice. And there is a counterclaim a counter argument from the opposition or the other states. When you present yourself just in the court and you are asked to start presenting your argument, you just give a very good background of the perspective. 
But Nepal is a landlocked country, a small country, landlocked country, hilly country, and the only way for its transportation or transit of goods to other part of the world is the Bay of Bengal. And it's an Indian territory that connects Nepal and the Bay of Bengal in between. So we therefore need to travel through Indian territory and if it is blocked, life becomes completely, life, life, life comes into complete jeopardy. And Nepal, this time, with this blocket, the life is in jeopardy. That's all. So you get how many things? Nepal is in between China and India. Nepal is landlocked. You have to travel to sea. And only port is uh, Bay of Bengal. And if goods do not go from Bay of Bengal to Nepal, people will not have food. George understands. So Nepal, Nepalese people will not have clothing. Nepalese people will not have medicine and everything. So he has the whole world open uh, in his mind by this short background. But some people immediately jump and what they do is like, uh, you wanna, my, my first camp is like, okay. Then he is not prepared, she is not prepared to listen to him. And then you say that this particular issue regarding blockade, therefore is not only of issue your honor that stops goods going to one place to another. But this blockade, your honor, relates to the right to life of the people. So this is not only blocked or physical act by one country to another country, but this is an issue of survival of people of one country and they have been deprived by another country. So it is in stark against international law. So I've been arguing in this case, the pertinent international law, your honor, and then we can enter into arguments. So that's a perspective. With this perspective, after you say this perspective, then what you need to go to do is like, you always, after a lot of research of the case, you, you implement your mind with a fundamental idea in your mind, okay? That's called core theory. You need always to create a core theory which passes a complex message to the judge should be instilled in your mind. And what is this core theory therefore is an expectation of yours that judge wants to make declare. You want to make judge to declare. For example, if you want in this particular case of locket, say or declare the International Court of Justice because Nepal and it's neighboring country, both are parties to the Sea Convention 1982. Therefore, one cannot violate 1982 Convention. Therefore, its blockade is a violation of Xi Law Convention. If you want to, if you want the judge to declare this is a judgment, this is your court. So when you do study, entire your study is to squeeze, okay? And then you have to create a core theory and into, put into mind. So ask or wait. Before you go to argument, ask to yourself, do you have any core theory in your mind? And if your mind says that, yes, this is core theory, and it immediately reproduces in your mind, you're successful, you're going to make. But if there is no clear core theory in your mind, it is better you come back from, the road, do not go in and speak. That becomes a police stupid idea to mooting. Sure, nobody goes to the mooting without core theory. So why we have been not able to make a lot of very interesting mooting? Though we know everything. We read the same document, we read the same law, we read the same convention, we, we are caught in the same way. But why do we fail? and other make it. The reason is like you do not have a concrete core theory to put into the mind of the judge, to convince the judge, yes, this is what. So second thing, after perspective, 
is that you need always a very concrete core theory that you need to develop. So in our legal language, in jurisprudence, that is what we call ratio decidendi. Okay? Even first year students, when a starting precedent, you have heard the word obiter dicta and ratio decidendi. So that ratio decidendi is like ratio means reason, the basis, decidendi, that decision, decision or other. Okay, the basis of decision is what is your core theory. Look from the court perspective. But if I think from the lawyer's perspective, that's my expectation. That my expectation, the court, I want court to do to me. So uh, that fundamental expectation of is is what is court theory. Now you have the court theory. Then you come to the fact. After you develop your court theory and you present court theory to the judge in a very nice way, repeatedly in a different way, you instill that this gentleman wants the court to declare the blockade as a violation of international law, that is, C Convention 80, 80, uh, uh, 1982. So once he, a C has that idea instilled in the mind, so the C will ask every question to you based on that court theory. And then you come to the fact. In the fact, what you need to do, very important, is that you need to identify the primary fact. You always have to be able to pick up the primary fact. Primary fact is that that fact is responsible to create the cause of action. Cause of action means you have come to the court that is action, and then it's cause that push you to, to the, go to the court. So that is called cause of action. So the cause of action is created by what? Primary. primary fact. If you are not able to pick up the primary fact, then you fail to pick up the cause of action. So you will be going in the court. It's so important. So after court theory, you convince the judge what is the cause of action that brought you to this court. Okay? Then you come to very important question. After you finalize the cause of action, then you want some questions the court need to set up. You ask questions to yourself. Is this law applicable in this case? Or you can say, is 1982 C Convention an applicable law in this case? Okay? Each transit right an absolute right? Does transit right reconfirmation of application by the transit country? Can landlocked country go to go to the International Court of Justice despite uh, another's non confirmation of the jurisdiction? This is the question. There are a couple of questions that you need to ask to you. But all of these questions are related with your core theory. So core theory, therefore, is it's something, the supply of power, where it's these questions that uh, you bring the spread of light. So you may have five questions, six questions, seven questions, or two questions that you ask to the judge and say that. In this court, you are on today, you have to decide on three important questions. One, this is an issue of blockage. A blockage is a means of state to cause another state to surrender on certain issues or ideas to the blockading state. But this relates to the right to life. And it relates to the transit. So Dodge 1982 Convention C convention applies to this blockade issue? Yes or no? Is what the court is supposed to decide on? This is how you ask the question. So after you shed light on this question, and what you do? Then you jump to argument. Okay? You come to the argument part. You have argument, and this argument 
what we say often is generalization of fact. Okay? You don't speak fact yourself, but we produce that fact into general form. For example, there must be purpose behind crime. Okay? There must be purpose behind crime. Is your theory. Because you are representing a moral case, but how do you start arguing there must be a purpose behind crime? So now immediately what you do? In this case also there is a purpose. And what is the purpose? That she declined to accept offer for the law, therefore he became jealous when she found a very nice boy and then he killed her. Okay? So there is a purpose. So generalized principle out of fact needs to be produced by you always. And this argument that you produce this way always needs to be supported by reasoning. And these reasonings are evidence. These evidence are packed inside the case. Therefore, in mooting, if you have strong grasp of compromise, you can make it better. But if you have read compromise a couple of times, you have no graphs of fact. How much principle, how much cases you study, you will make nothing. So, even in a minor mood court, I suggest that read 100 times, read compromise 100 times, writing, and understand every fact connected how, and then sequence of one fact to another fact. One fact is a cause and another fact is an effect. All these things, if you grasp that, when you have an argument and you give reasoning, you bring these facts from there and you use it in that argument. So compromise has everything for you. A smart motor, a very smart motor, even do not study anything, reads and understands compromise very well, goes to the mood, makes a beautiful presentation. Sometime even, sometime even he may or she may win the mood. But if you have not studied compromise, but you have studied all international principles, but you don't understand, you don't understand the fact, then you fail. So international law and background, all this study is like just a gunpowder, okay? If this gunpowder is not converted into bullet, it doesn't fire. So having gunpowder without bullet, you can, can you fight a war? Suppose that you have millions of trucks gunpowder in your country, you're falling in a war with some other country in your neighborhood. So can you say that I have one million trucks of gunpowder, so I will definitely win the war. And when war starts, you have nothing to fire, okay? Everything is here, but nothing is there. So bullets needs to be created. So that's how fact needs to be clarified. So you need to make a bullet as reason to support your argument. And one day then comes citation. So your evidence or your reasoning should be supported by authority. This authority in international voting, the first authority is treaty. You always should rely on treaty as much as possible. Okay? If you do not have exclusive treaty to govern you, you can infer treaty not absolutely governing your field, but applicate, applying in similar other fact. For example, if you have, if you have been arguing humanitarian law, Geneva Convention. But if there is no specific provision in Geneva Convention, you can borrow from international human rights law, UDHR and other, and you can extrapolate in, uh, in humanitarian law. So the first, you have to pick up treaty, and if not treaty, then you can pick up <coughs> existing or relevant treaties. After that, the Interpretation of the jurisprudence established by International Court of Justice and other international courts are also very important. Okay? What I often say is that International Court of Justice judgment and treaty are always well connected. Once the judgment of the International Court of Justice is there, and then you also have a treaty. 
These two things in the future are always get connected by customary internet law. So customary internet law therefore is very, very important source. But sometimes, occasionally it may not be an independent reasoning of the source for you. But it is inevitable. So use customary international law to glue treaty and the judgment of the court already. And only then comes opinion jurors. That means the opinions of the jurist and some other <coughs> things. So this is how the ladder of the citation you have to shine. But how do we, how do we uh, uh, make it like when I sit as a judge in moot court, what I do is like, people immediately start talking about, talking about Oppenheim, Stark, and other. And then they talk about Nicaragua case. And then they talk about some customary law. And finally, they say that this is treaty. Go on, suicide. So I get zero. But if people start talking, this is the fundamental provision established by treaty. And this treaty has been well, this treaty has been well interpreted by International Court of Justice in Nicaragua case or something like that. And this international interpretation, the interpretation of International Court of Justice of this particular treaty is well backed by prevalent customary international law. If you show the international law, then it becomes very plausible. And then you come to the you come to the opinion jurors, then case becomes very stronger. So that's how. And this is our next argument, next argument, next argument. And in conclusion, I always suggest you need to repeat your core theory again. How do you do is that in the very beginning, at the very outset, your owner. I expected this court to declare that the blockage Nepal is now going through is a violation of 1982 Sheila Convention and thus it deprives human rights guaranteed by ICCPR and IC uh, International uh, Economic and Civil and Political Rights. Thus with the argument that I made before this honorable court. I confirm that I, I, I confirm that this court needs to declare that Sheila Convention is outrightly violent. Sure, that's a one bracket with court theory, one bracket with conclusion. Both way, their court theory, an entire body that you speak is only related to court theory, nothing else. Why we fail in Moot Court? Because we scatter ourselves. We scatter from India to China, from USA to Latin America, to Mongolia to Sri Lanka. And we don't pass any message to the mind of the judge. Therefore, we fail communicating convincingly to the judge. This way, we fail to pick up the mind from the here and put into the mind of judge. Therefore, we fail. Therefore, this is one. Now, little art, what you need to do always is that when you speak about perspective, you need to have a signpost. Before you go from uh, perspective to core theory, just jumping, like uh, uh, never do, never do something. In villages, like the young girls play in a uh, in, a, in a ground making these boxes, okay? And they have a small stone and then one leg, they jump other, okay? And sometimes they jump two, two, two blocks. Never do that. That's absolutely not acceptable in uh, profession. So keep in the mind that when you go to the court, never do what the goals do in that game. What is that game called? Exana. Putte. Kutte, okay. Never do kutte. Okay, never do kutte in boss. Rather, when you finish perspective, you're telling perspective that Nepal is in a blockade. People have no food. People have no fuel. People have no medicine. And there is a big chaos in the society. And people have been 
outrightly deprived of their right to life. Okay? So, in this situation, this case has come to the court. Pause a little bit and then say that with this very brief uh, perspective, Your Honor, now I would like to jump into my fundamental expectation. The fundamental theory that I would like to put before this court today, that the court needs to declare, court needs to help my client, my party, or my country to get rid of this situation. So this is what is her signpost. Before you go to uh, court theory, you attract the judge and say that, now you explain court theory. When you explain court theory, it is a theory that repeat a couple of times, but without letting judge that you are repeating the same time. Don't do that. This is one time, second time, and third time. No. I said that C law is violated. In other words, he said that no state can violate C convention. And again, you can repeat another way. Because this is UN convention, every country, every member state have legal obligation to abide by the convention. So this is called. So something which remark you make in between uh, the perspective and court theory, that remark is called shine post. That means now you go this way. Okay. Now direction is there. Another sign post is there. Okay. When you walk on a road, there is a sign post to go. Okay. Bhaktapur go stay. When the road extends, then what it says? There is another uh, uh, arrow and it shows that Bhaktapur this way. That is what is called sign post. When you finish core theory, then again do the same. I said repeat a couple of times. And then now prepare the judge to listen that with this made presented well job before you. And if you don't have, uh, I, I, I have nothing to help you honor with this regard, then I would like to go to explain the very fundamental fact of this case. And if the judge says that, okay, go ahead, and then you start explaining the primary fact. You do the same. After you finish explaining primary fact, again, there is a signpost, okay? What you do after the uh, primary fact, you go to the question. Again, you have a signpost. You say something. With this primary fact, now, I would like to aware the judge of some very important questions that needs to be uh, uh, answered by this court today to settle this judgment, to, to settle this case, Your Honor. Now, number one, okay, this is how every time you keep post, sign post between one argument to another argument, you always keep a little post and little post and again you do uh, sign post. So art, therefore, is of good speech, of good body language, <coughs> most importantly, this is what your fundamental reason of winning. Many people argue like this. Your owner, <laughs> she law convention, violet law. Okay. Some people do like yeah, no, no too, not, not too much, not too less. Remain yourself flexible, okay? Move your hand, but not like this, okay? So it would be nice, your honor, this it, okay? Your honor, 1982 conventions violation creates human right violence, terrible human right violence, okay? And fears is always you need to be able to present your face that you are absolutely inquisitive. You want question, okay? And you should be able to show that you are fully confident. And you know that no woman can deliver a baby if she is not pregnant. So what is the use of going to labor, labor room if you are not pregnant, my ladies and my boys? Okay? Can your husband take you to labor room if you are not pregnant? Show what is like that. Show what is pregnancy here therefore. Lot of ideas is what in your mind is confirms that you are pregnant. Only then it is used to go to labor room. In labor room, if you fight with the doctor, give a punch in the nose of the doctor, 
Will you deliver successfully? No. You cooperate with the doctor and you feel that you are not going to die. Most importantly, what you believe is that this pain is going to in infuminate, and after that, I will have such a nice daughter with me, and I will be so happy. And you start thinking that next year she will be catching my finger, and I will be going to I, I, I will be going to mom's house. Then you are very happy, and doctor suggests you you do it in few hours. A nice baby is there. But if you think that, ah, I do it by my way, then you will be struggling, you fall down from the bed down and probably you will die. Okay, second thing. When you deliver the baby, you exhaust. Okay, you exhaust. You're tired, you get exhausted. Therefore, you need not to do those much things that keeps you further exhaust, make you further exhaustion, and maybe you may die. So, come brilliantly in front of the judge. Speak nice. Never be worried that you are going to win or you are going to lose. Only think and be concerned that I need to convince the judge by very good way, so I have good stuff in the mind, and then therefore I am going to transfer it. So when you come to judge, you have only three things, your mind, your tongue, and your hand. Okay, keep these three things together. If you are able to keep these three things together, mode code is like a kote game. You can definitely do it without crisis. No umpire is there. Is there umpire? So don't feel that there is a judge. Only feel that there is your idea. So your role is to produce idea. He will judge. Definitely positive because you have the core theory spelled out to him and he cannot go or he cannot go against it. So art of advocacy therefore is an art of convincing audience. Yes, is judge. That's all. That's what I understand. And I do that. I do exactly what I say. Okay? Therefore, I'm not afraid going to the court. Because I have my court theory developed. I forget the case. I do not look at it. But tomorrow I have a case. I will look that memorandum. I remember my court theory I developed after my research. I have my arguments already there. I have my citation already there. I ask, collect all those things, let's go. And then, happy, I start speaking to judge. What I have a strong belief is that if you start plausibly speaking to the judge, the judge always becomes happy. Because judge is there in the court to learn ideas from you. He is not or she is not testing you. He is not or she is not putting you in examination. So they look for ideas. More good ideas you go give in a skillful way by artful manner, judge will be pretty much happy and therefore you ensure that the judgment will go in your favor. But this is what the uh, uh, biggest problem with the Nepalese student is that they always take moot court or even court case is a game to win or lose. And they always are in stress. They always are with some expectation not to be fulfilled. And therefore, they are stressful. When they go to court or in the mood court with a stressful mind, so a kind of psyche emerges. And then they are in big tension. And therefore, mind does not produce the word. Tongue does not produce the word. And finger becomes tremble, therefore, even if you are doing body language, then you uh, do like that. The things that he is too much alcoholic, this man is gone. Showcase it first. So come out of that. You need to learn a lot of this kind of thing. So there are more court videos somewhere uh, in, in YouTube that we have done. There are a lot of more court videos. You can contact, you can talk with Roxy and other 
that we have made presentation in the court and other. You can look into that. Okay. So that's all. Therefore, this video. Can you show this again? Technically, sir. To a case where a student had been arrested by Anchaladis that time for political activities and he had been in jail for a long time. I was teaching in Pokhara. So his brother and his mother repeatedly came to us and said that why they have been putting him in jail. It is almost three years. His education is gone, everything is gone. Every six months they release. But they bring from the jail to the Anshala this office and Anshala this writes again that he is dangerous for the peace and order of the society and then they transfer to the jail again. So we brought this issue to that is called regional court Chetriya of Dalat and uh, uh, Om Bhakta Swesta and Kedarnath Upadhyay. Both of them later on became uh, chief justice of this country. They were there. So we said that he is in jail for three years. Maybe the first time he was danger to the society. But now he's in jail. They bring to Anshala this office again and say that he is danger again. So how someone can become danger being in jail to outside? So you need to issue uh, heavy escapes and get, it, get this man released because he's a student. He has been completely spoiled, its life is completely spoiled because he has not been able to participate in the education. So sure. that was I was supposed to say. I wrote the I wrote the petition we prepared it every day, okay? Couple of us, young professors from Prativi Nairan campus, we met morning, day, evening and talking, reading, talking reading. At some point the information became too much in our mind, we got lost somewhere. Okay? If we have to speak with this, this information that we have collected from all books, probably we can argue for one year. Now we started becoming very upset, like what to say, what not to say, because too much information was there. Anyway, we started out and we went to the court. From morning, uh, the whole night I didn't sleep. Okay, what happens tomorrow? What happens tomorrow? Okay. The morning before I went to the court, I think I went 20 times to the toilet <laughs> to take pee, very little. Okay. And again, come, I think that I should go again. Okay, I ate food but without any interest. Then a kind of uh, uh, jerking heart. It is jerking all the time. Tuk, 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 tuk. It was like that. We came to the court. I, I actually looked this court day before yesterday. It used to be so nice. We used to go every day. We used to talk with the court. And then I saw that it is something like a monster's house. Okay. So by the time I, come to the, I, I came to the court, I was wishing at I was wishing to listen the news that somebody died there for closes court. <laughs> then I could feel that, yes, I was ready, but it was the court holiday. Okay, I would go happily and would start being in tension next day. We entered the court. Then we went to the courtroom. Our case was hard. So lawyers started arguing. And I thought that why this lawyer speaks so few? Why don't he or she keeps arguing the case and take the whole day so that we could say that today there was no turn of hour, okay? Then he finished. I wish that the another, job, another lawyer would continue the whole day. And then that also didn't happen, finish in 20 minutes. Now it's out. The judges started looking into the case file. I was wishing that they must do some order uh, ask some evidence for next day. Uh, but they looked into that and I was looking that will they find some loopholes in the case so that they say that okay next time do this first and something like that. But they didn't find any loophole. Now they say that okay who is 
in this case. Okay. And then we three show that we are. Okay, now you can begin. So according to the rule, I was supposed to start. First, I stood up and then I said the name and then I don't know what happened. <laughs> one minute I was <laughs> I was literally one minute air. I was painted. I did not know anything. The moment I was grabbing the table, I opened my eyes. I could see that I fell, I fainted. But judges did not fortunately notice me that I was painted because they were busy at file. They thought that I was busy in my file. <laughs> okay. Then they said that, okay, go on, please. Then I thought that I will make a very beautiful uh, presentation, but uh, I fumbled. I could do no better, but understanding the point they read that we are read and that, but also understanding that this is a very good teacher, but this is first time uh, in his uh, career of law profession. So that's okay. Uh, not much today. Uh, let's have a let's have a uh, show cut. So they will present the they present the guests, and then we will. So immediately, in three minutes, they issue the show cuts notice. I stop. I knew that. Why that happened? Because I was not systematic. We were not taught about this art. So from that day, I started learning. And then I started uh, uh, putting a skill and arts. Next time, I have enough, uh, I have enough uh, course to go but I still were not systematic. Then I started reading book in the library about the trial advocacy argument, and then I started reading like uh, uh, pleading without tears, how to plead with a smile, how to answer the question when George asks. A lot of this art of advocacy books. Then I started picking in two or three minutes, two or three months. I got another very important case. So in that case. Five boys have been charged with trafficking of women uh, for prostituting. Okay? Uh, five uh, students, one of them was one student, uh, and four other not from Pokhara, picked up a girl. She was professionally providing sex service in the city. They took her to somewhere, but uh, uh, then there was a altercations with regard to the price she was expecting and these boys didn't have that much money. They said that we will give you tomorrow, but she didn't, she started uh, shouting and then people knew it. So finally, the case was converted into trafficking. They picked me up and then they uh, 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 raped me, okay? So that case was there. So all of them were laureate son. Laureate son means people having money. Then uh, I was hired to uh, represent them in the uh, in the uh, rape case. Okay. Also trapped. Two cases were there. That was my third case. Ten days I prepared when they were in custody. And I presented my argument in this case. I spoke one and a half hour without any uh, kind of faulting uh, uh, speech with full vigor, with perfect way, demanding, putting argument, citing evidence. And that was the case where almost 300 people from Pohara city, because of their relatives, have gone to the court, observed me, and uh, really, really, it happens, okay? Really, it happens in a case of rape and trafficking. In the first, uh, in the first hearing, people are granted bail. But in this case, I own five people have been released on bail of some monetary bond, and that was uh, unusual thing happened in the court. The judge became mesmerizingly convinced 
with the idea that he made. So later on, George told me that I actually still could not pass that order, but uh, I never had in my life listen an argument like you made. So for two things, I gave bail to them because if I didn't give you give the bail to these people, you would be frustrated and you will not be a good lawyer. One. Second thing, I was convinced. So I, had, I was not afraid. Okay? So that's what the judge said. And the beautiful remark I listened coming out was like, from the grandmother of one of the brothers, what is this? 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 That's what you need to do, okay? Like a jumra here, the protect case for Taira Erinsa. You need to do exactly in the case. Therefore, this case made me hero in power. 1944, Driya Zar Chawalisa. Ma Poitali Sajar Bospi was something like Bislak, I go. Shaman. Not only teacher. Almost 100 students in the middle of the Okay? So after that, I never had a problem. I never have any constraint because now I exactly go to go to go to court to argue with the style that I said before. I have my court theory in the mind. It's instilled in my mind. And also I have written. Citation I cannot keep in the mind and I don't put my mind in stress. Okay? I always write it in my memory now, so you can see and you can remember. No, samjana na saki ne kura dilag na samjana prayat na karne. Why not? So I have the argument. It is also not necessary that you remember all argument you have. But what I do often do is like I, I have a meta card. Okay, I have a meta card. First argument, I have this meta card. I use this meta card. I never use it. And then I finish it. Then I have another meta card. Another argument. Okay, and sometimes another style of doing is like suppose that this is a book. If I don't have a time to uh, make meta card, what do I, what do I do is like inside after one argument I have uh, in this book uh, page number twelve. I have a citation for that like uh, uh, George uh, George Lord Atkin says. Okay, his quotation. I read it to the judge and explain. And this is the post-it. Now go to page number 35, okay? The post-it only says, go to page number 23. And in the 23rd, there is a shine. And I open it, and then it is already marked what I need to say there. So then there is a case. I read it and explain. And what I do is there is like, and then I another post-it. Now go to page number 96. <coughs> Your supply remember the dinner like in express karame when and then I go it I finish that citation and I take it another one. So that's how the method you guide. Most brilliant and most inevitable and most important thing not to be painted. If you have a stressful hot mind, you will forget. So keep your mind cool when you so never prepare the case just before you go to the court. You finish it. Let the mind be uh, in peace, in a uh, kind of thing like uh, have a leisure. Mind has limitation. This is a biology. It's not a machine. It's not a computer. Computer to touch or a pankhara gaya sa mitra. Okay? Kyo pankha chale ya ki na? Tesko ma tao dhukta rasa na? If you do not give mind rest for a couple of hours before you go to the court, never believe in the, world, in the life that you will make. Good court or case, you will fail. But if you have a couple of hours rest before you go, mind already gets good and don't think anything about uh, go, uh, anything about case when you go. So you need to keep that. Only then you do. So it is usual for everyone the first time they get painted. Because the respondent has uh, some problem with that, it means that the uh, 
respondent as well. So in that, uh, what would be the appropriate? Yeah, that, that's an idea with regard to the primary fact. Okay, it's a primary fact for the petitioners and also the respondent. You start conflicting and you start contradicting to each other. If the if the petitioner has to establish the cause of action. What respondent is supposed to do to challenge the same cause of action and saying that this is not a cause of action? So people say that uh, it is always easy for petitioner, but it is always uh, uh, easy. Uh, it, it's always said that it is hard for petitioner, but it is always difficult for respondent. Okay. So. When he makes argument, you have to give a counter argument, but you respondents have to with. You need to be thinking like, uh, what are the possible cause of action? Then, if you see there are two possible uh, cause of action, and if he picks up one, you have to counter that and you have to refer to the another cause of action. You can say that not that is the cause of action. This is the cause of action. What? Well, okay. Or. Uh, uh, you can you can uh, totally ignore the cause of action part, and then you come down to the argument in another way. So when I say you have to look into cause of action in primary fact, respondents should understand that same thing applies. So when he uh, petitioner looks for cause of action, you need to look for. Also cause of action, because if you don't know the cause of action, you cannot frame your my, uh, argument, okay? You need to look for the cause of action, but you also need to look for counter argument to disprove that that's a cause of action. So you go in the same way. But respondents have more responsibility to do than petitioner, because you have to defend, and you have to do everything they do, but you also have to counter them. So therefore, there is a double responsibility, sure? Uh, many students think that la respondent for hey, unai le bolechi hai, bolna pani kya mazaa hai? Okay, you're putting in danger. So it's better to have petitioner because two way sympathy, first speaker definitely get it. Okay, and another another way you can propose something. You don't have to much defend yourself because you you also have a rebuttal and other. But the respondent has. Major responsibility, what the judge believes is that he knows everything, he heard everything, he got a chance to think about the idea, and now he is putting such a hopeless argument. So, so more danger you are in. Just Anything?